everyone, and thank you for joining me through the Blackthorn Arch, a podcast all about folk tales, fairy stories, and ghostly encounters in the UK. My name is Hearth, spelt H-E-A-R-T-H, and today we're going to be talking about just a few of the hundreds of ghostly sightings that occur in the Tower of London. Before we get started, I do just want to put in a little bit of a warning here. Because we're talking about the Tower of London, we are going to be including some of its history, and its history is brutal. So if you don't want to hear about imprisonment or executions, this is not going to be the episode for you. I do have others that you can watch, and there's another next week which is going to be on a different topic. So just a warning here, if this is not the kind of episode that you want to watch or listen to, that's completely fine, I completely understand. But I didn't want to skip over the history when it comes to the ghosts and the history of the Tower of London. So with that being said, those of you who want to continue, let's get into the episode. Now, the Tower of London is a fascinating place with hundreds of years of history and millions of visitors every single year. But alongside the tourists, there are a few residents who haven't left after death. These hauntings and sightings range from the intriguing to the downright confusing, and today we're going to be talking about just a few of my favourites, if you could call a haunting a favourite. There are so many hauntings in this location that it's one of the most well-known haunted sites in the British Isles, and there are so many different individual spirits that some of them haven't even been identified. Now, the site itself has an extraordinarily long history. The site was initially built on by William the Conqueror after his coronation in 1066. And from this point onwards, the site has been a bustling hub of activity, of buildings being built and demolished, altered and rebuilt again for hundreds of years, until it becomes what we know it today, the Tower of London, home to some of the most infamous ghosts of history, and also the crown jewels. In 1110, the area was converted into a prison, and not just any prison, one that was designed to hold and execute high-ranking members of society who had been accused of politically related crimes, individuals such as Anne Boleyn, Lady Jane Grey, and Sir Thomas More, among many others. And it remained a prison till it eventually closed in 1952, So as you can see, it has an exceptionally long history, but it wasn't solely a prison. Throughout its time, it was also an armory, a mint, a treasury, as well as being a royal residence alongside the prison till the 17th century. And despite contrary belief, there were actually not that many executions that were carried out on the site itself. Only very high-ranking members of society were actually executed within the grounds. For the most part, everyone else that was executed was done outside of the Tower of London, rather than on the property itself, which makes it very interesting and goes to explain why so many of the hauntings are actually carried out by these high-ranking members of society, these very influential people that we'll be talking about in a moment. There have been hundreds of ghostly encounters reported from the Tower of London, some from visitors, others from passers-by, and quite a few from people who actually work on the site on a daily basis. Whether all of these are to be believed is entirely up to you, though I will say that for the past few decades, there has been a big push on the haunted aspect of the Tower of London. It's been very highly marketed, And so for a lot of the more modern accounts, it may well be that the influence of the idea that this location is haunted plays a big part in what they see, in what they feel, and who they believe it to have been. But for the most part, a lot of these accounts do show very similar events occurring repeatedly. And these events are usually tied to several highly important figures within British history, largely British royalty. Now, the first person we're going to be talking about today is probably one of my favourites in history, full stop, and that is Lady Jane Grey, the shortest reigning queen in British history. Now, I've always loved Lady Jane Grey. Since I was a child, when we had to do a school project, I would always choose Lady Jane Grey to talk about and to research and to paint, and I have just been fascinated with her history. And she is probably, for me at least, one of the most interesting figures to have been kept and executed in the Tower of London. This story begins in the 1550s, when King Edward VI was on his deathbed. He needed to choose a successor, and the Protestant king wanted a Protestant successor, 
so he chose the Protestant Lady Jane Grey to become queen after his death. He chose her over his own sister, Mary Tudor, who was a Catholic. Lady Jane Grey was only queen for nine days before Mary Tudor did something about it, imprisoning both her and her husband in the Tower of London, making her the shortest reigning queen in British history. They were both beheaded on the 12th of February, 1554, her husband dying before her. She was only 18 at the time of her death, and it's said that after her death, she is seen wandering the halls of the tower looking lost and confused, and both of them can be seen together in the lead up to the date of their execution every year. This took one guard by surprise when patrolling the courtyard on the 12th of February 1957, he heard above his head the distinctive sound of a guillotine, and upon looking up towards the tower, he saw the headless Lady Jane Grey wandering around the turrets. He was so terrified and so confused and baffled about this unexplainable event that he quit soon after. And honestly, I don't blame him. That sounds terrifying. I don't know about anyone else, but the sound of a guillotine alone is enough to send me running. There's something about that distinctive sound that makes my blood run cold. But to not only hear the terrifying sound of a guillotine, but to then also look up and see a headless ghost? Nope. I think even I would have called it at that. I think that would have been me done. You know, that that's bad. <laughs> that's creepy. Just a note here, but Lady Jane Grey wasn't actually executed via guillotine. She was actually executed with an axe and executioner. I'm not sure where the guillotine comes from, whether the guard mistook the sound of an axe for a guillotine, whether he assumed it was a guillotine that was used, or whether the articles reporting this account have warped over time, but almost everywhere it implies that the sound was of a guillotine, when no guillotine was actually used in this case. Now, Lady Jane Grey isn't the only queen to have been executed within the Tower of London. Probably one of the most famous ghosts of all time in this area is that of Anne Boleyn. Now, Anne Boleyn is most famously known as being the second queen of King Henry VIII, but she wasn't always his queen. Originally, she came to King Henry VIII's court as one of Queen Catherine of Aragon's ladies-in-waiting, which made it all the more scandalous. After Catherine of Aragon could not produce a male heir, the king's eyes began to wander, settling on Anne Boleyn. Now, there was an entire process to getting his marriage to Catherine of Aragon thrown out so that he had the ability to marry Anne Boleyn, and when he did, she also failed to produce him a male heir. Now, when this happened, it is believed that the king accused her of adultery, treason, among other things, in order to get her sent away so that he could marry someone else. And she was sent to the Tower of London, where she was eventually beheaded on the 19th of May, 1536. Now, after this point, her spirit has been seen wandering around the grounds. She's usually seen within the gardens, wandering alone at night, carrying her head in her arms, which is kind of nice, actually. You know, she's wandering, she's enjoying the scenery, she can still see everything. I mean, Lady Jane Grey, she didn't have a head, so she was just wandering around and she couldn't see anything. But I mean, at least Anne Boleyn was carrying hers. That doesn't make it much better. I'm just trying to make light of how gruesome these events were because this was a brutal time to be in England. This was absolutely brutal. But at least she's wandering the grounds with her head, which is better than most people end up with. The next two spirits we're gonna be talking about probably have one of the saddest stories of them all. Now, all of these stories are sad. All sudden endings like this are terrible. But the unanswered questions that go behind these two spirits probably make it the worst of them all. These are two child spirits that are said to haunt what is now known as the Bloody Tower. Now, this story begins with King Edward IV, who had two sons, but died unexpectedly. His two children, heirs to the throne, were Richard and Edward V. They were not yet old enough to claim the throne, being only nine and 12 respectively, so their uncle, Richard III, took the throne in their place till they came of age. However, the two boys 
would never come of age. It has long been believed that King Richard III didn't want to give up that king title once he'd received it, and so he convinced the general public and the courts that the two boys were actually illegitimate heirs, and had them locked up within the Tower of London. Now this is bad enough, but in 1483, the boys suddenly vanished without trace, and they were never seen again. Now, it was widely believed that King Richard III had something to do with this, that he was so determined to not give up his king title that he had the two boys murdered. However, their bodies were never discovered, and no one knew what happened to them. That was until 1674, when two child's bodies were discovered in a box during an excavation of a secret stairwell compartment within the tower, these two bodies were believed to be the ages of the boys when they had gone missing, and it's believed that these two bodies are the two princes that suddenly disappeared. Now, since their death from the 15th century up until the modern day, you can often hear children's laughter through the towers. You can see two young boys in white nightgowns running around the building, and they're often seen playing on the buttresses. But the saddest bit about this entire thing is that we'll never know for sure what happened to these two children. Did they escape? Were they smuggled out of the tower? Did they end up in a different country, in a different place, in a different life? Or is the story true? Did their uncle really murder them, stuff their bodies into a small box, and then seal it inside a stairwell that was never used again? Like, that is such a brutal end. So this is probably the worst story of them all. But for me, it's also the most fascinating because it's one of the only stories where people were experiencing the ghostly hauntings, but they didn't even know that the children were dead. They were seeing two boys running around the building when the boys had gone missing, but no one realized yet what had happened to them. So it's one of the only cases where there was not a known death when the haunting started, which I always find so fascinating. Now we go from two lost boys to what is probably one of the most famous British legends of history, and that is Guy Fawkes. In 1605, there was a plot led by a resistance group against the Protestant King James I. This was known as the Gunpowder Plot. The plot was carried out by a man named Guy Fawkes, and his story is remembered on the 5th of November, when this plot was meant to have taken place. And every year there are firework displays, there are large bonfires where people burn effigies on the fire. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. You can go for bonfires and it's known as Bonfire Night. And there's an entire song, Remember, Remember, the 5th of November. There's more lines to it, but it's a really interesting story in itself that if you have the chance to research a little bit more about, if you don't already know it, it could be a really interesting story to learn about. His story is now world famous, not for its success, but actually his failure in his attempt to blow up the House of Lords. And many people to this day still celebrate it either for his failure or for his attempt, depending on who you are. <laughs> Now, on the 5th of November, his plot failed, and he was captured before his plan could be enacted. He was taken to a cell in the White Tower, where he was hung, drawn, and quartered, arguably one of the most brutal executions that you could experience. And it's said that his screams and cries for help can still be heard by some today. Now, he is among just many famous individuals who were brought to the Tower of London. Another is Sir Walter Riley. Now, he was beheaded by order of James I, but during his stay, he lived a life of seeming luxury compared to other people, and his living quarters have remained much the same today as they were in the 16th century. And unlike the other prisoners, who were seen screaming, wailing, or walking around with their heads in their arms, his spirit is said to walk along portrait-filled corridors, looking and admiring at the artwork. And if that doesn't sound like a peaceful time, I don't know what does. Just wandering the halls, looking at pretty artwork. That sounds quite nice compared to some of the others in this list. But of all the stories, one is probably the most infamous of them all. And it's not Anne Boleyn, it's not Lady Jane Grey, it's actually Margaret Pole, 
the Countess of Salisbury. And I have found during my research of this topic that this story in particular is the one that gets elaborated on the most and it becomes this fantastical story. So I'm hoping to be able to give a more accurate version from what I've been researching, but I will add in the elaborated version at the end. So Margaret Pole was Countess of Salisbury, and it's said that she has one of the most bloody and gruesome executions of all of them that were carried out in the Tower of London. She's the niece of two kings, King Richard III and King Edward IV, however her status didn't do much to help her. Her family very much annoyed the crown, particularly when they spoke out against King Henry VIII's marriage to Anne Boleyn. Her son denounced the king after he separated church and state, which obviously made him very, very angry. King Henry VIII decided he wanted her son, and when he fled the country and could no longer be found, King Henry VIII turned his attention on the Countess of Salisbury. Now, being in her 60s, the Countess could not flee like her son had, and so was captured and imprisoned in the Tower of London, where she remained for two and a half years. Now, after her stay in the Tower, she was sent to execution. And here's where the story varies quite dramatically. It is believed that her executioner was inexperienced, and instead of taking her head off in one clean blow, instead he hacked at her until eventually her head was removed and she died. Now, this is brutal enough as it is, but the other version of the story is that she did not want to be executed. And so instead of allowing herself to accept that fate, she got up and she ran, where the executioner proceeded to chase her around and hack at her while she was running away until she eventually died. Now, this story has been largely debunked. It's believed that this is not the real story. Instead, it's more likely that the executioner was inexperienced, the blade was not sharp enough, and so it was a bloody affair, to say the least, and that is saying something for a place that's known as the Bloody Tower of London. Yeah, this one's a really gruesome story, I'm sorry about that, but I just found it so interesting. And it's said that to this day, people can still hear this event taking place on the anniversary of her death, which I can only imagine is a truly horrific sound to hear. Although most of the stories from the Tower of London make sense, they are repetitions of things that have happened in the past echoes of history, some hauntings are downright strange, and that's what we're going to be talking about next. Now, one of the most infamous is a haunted suit of armour that is said to have been worn by King Henry VIII. Although most objects that were used in the tower historically are now found in museums or kept safely, this is one of the few items that stays within the tower, and it's said that it's because no one wants to deal with moving it because of all of the events that happen around this object. Guards and workers within the tower have said that around this suit of armour, the temperature in the room drops considerably. Even on a warm day, it can drop dramatically when you're standing near this suit of armour. But not all the time, only sometimes, which makes you think it might not be the cold metal of the armour that's doing it. Maybe it's something more ghostly. The most dramatic events occurred when several guards were guarding the armour as well as the building itself, and they felt themselves being strangled as though someone was gripping at their throats, suffocating them, but they could see no one around and there was nothing that could be causing it. And on one occasion, this was so intense, it felt like a piece of fabric was being pulled against their throats. And when it ended, they had red marks around their necks as though something had actually been hurting them physically. From this point on, after so many events and ghostly encounters with the suit of armor, it was eventually moved. And it's believed that to this day, these same ghostly encounters still happen, but a little bit more away from the public eye. Alongside a haunted suit of armour, there are other oddities roaming the grounds as well. As mentioned, the tower wasn't solely a prison, it was also a royal residency, where there were humans as well as animals. Three lions were gifted to King Henry III by the Roman Emperor Frederick II in the 1230s, and within the grounds, a royal menagerie was set up in 1210 by King John, which was home to hundreds of exotic animals. 
Now, unfortunately, many of these animals were fought for sport and entertainment, but this was eventually phased out and replaced with what we may now see as more of a zoo. Sadly, poor conditions and a lack of understanding about the requirements these animals had led to many animals dying on the site, including elephants, tigers, and bears. The zoo, as it became known, was eventually shut down in 1835 due to many tragedies that occurred during this time, but paranormal activity of the animal kind still occurs frequently on this site. And this includes everything from a barrage of stampeding, red-eyed phantom horses to the roar of a lion on the tower at dusk, and everything that you can think of in between. Now, in most of these cases, the hauntings aren't dangerous. They don't put anyone in harm's way. They aren't physically attacking anyone. But that isn't always the case. One guard in 1816 was chased up the staircase into an office by a dark shadow. He slammed the door, expecting that it would leave him alone, but it didn't. Instead, the dark shadow seeped under the door and on the other side transformed itself into a large black bear. Taking his bayonet, he tried to stab the bear, thinking that it was a real animal, something that he needed to defend himself against, except the bayonet passed straight through the spirit and rammed itself into the door. It seems that the bear was quite happy with the amount of terror that it had created, and so just dissipated into nothing, leaving the guard absolutely terrified. And ultimately, this man died just two days later of a heart attack. Now, are they related? Was this a hallucination caused by problems that led to him having a heart attack? Or did this actually cause a heart attack due to the sheer amount of stress that this man experienced? We will never know, but it's a really fascinating story. Now, not all of the ghosts that reside within this area are identified. There's one spirit that's known as the White Lady or the Lady in White who resides within the White Tower. You can see a lot of similarities here. Now, this spirit has never been identified. They don't really know who she is. They have a few theories, but they've never truly pinned it down because she never sticks around for long enough. Some of these spirits have turned to look at people where you can identify their faces, you can recognize who they are based on the circumstances of the haunting. But for this spirit, there doesn't seem to be any identifiable features. Now she is primarily seen as a white mist out of the corner of your eye. And it's been reported that she can be seen standing in a window, waving at children in a tower across the grounds, but she has never been identified. She's usually followed by a pungent smell of old-fashioned perfume. Now, this perfume can be so strong that it fills up an entire room with exceptionally strong fragrance, which is what happens apparently quite frequently in St. John's Chapel. And many visitors claim to smell this phantom perfume that they have no known origin for, or to feel a tap on their shoulder only to turn around and see nothing more than a white mist vanishing up a staircase. There are so many cases of this that she is probably one of the most well-known or at least well-sighted spirits at the Tower of London, but no one truly knows who she is. Now there are dozens more sightings, dozens more ghosts of different figures from history and folklore, and also unidentified spirits as well. So I just had to pick a few of my favorites, and I really love the fact that these are recognizable figures from history. Now, of course, none of these are nice. It might be fun to hear about the potential sightings, but it's also important to remember the sheer trauma that these people went through. Many of the spirits that resided to the people who were kept at the Tower of London actually did nothing wrong. Of course, some people like Guy Fawkes did try to blow up the House of Lords, which is, you know, pretty bad. But Anne Boleyn was kept in this prison and executed for nothing more than not providing a male heir. It baffles me, it saddens me, but it's a fascinating story. Now, I have not had the chance to go to the Tower of London myself, but I would love to know if any of you have been to the Tower of London. Have you had any ghostly encounters? Have you seen, smelt, or experienced anything that you simply couldn't explain. I would absolutely love to know. One day I will have to go to the Tower of London, but it's so busy, there's so many people, and I don't, I don't like people. So we'll have to see. Hopefully one day I will be able to go for myself. 
With that all being said, I hope you did enjoy this episode. If you did, we have other episodes available. We have about six episodes already available so that you can watch those and catch up on them if you haven't already. If you are listening to this podcast, you can also watch the video version on YouTube under the YouTube channel Through the Blackthorn Arch. And there, there will be additional photos and other imagery that might help you visualize the story a little bit better. If you are watching this on YouTube, then you can also listen to this on the go on podcast platforms, including on Spotify, Anchor, and other platforms. The links to those will be in the description box. And I hope that I can get you to the Blackthorn Arch next week for another fascinating folk tale or ghostly encounter. Till then, I hope you're all staying safe, I hope you have a marvellous magical day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!